Good morning, Center Church. If you haven't met before, my name is Jack, and I am the Youth and Discipleship Resident here at Center Church. And I'm not going to beat around the bush. We're just going to jump right into it. The question for you today is, what is a circumstance you're in that you would trade away for anything else? What's an area of your life that you just feel uncomfortable in? That gives you nothing but a source of, like, uneasiness? Or, you know what, let's even up it a little bit more. What's an area of your life that just frustrates you? That just makes you angry? That if you could change it, if it was in your power to change it, you would. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your financial situation. Maybe it's your relationship. I don't know what it is, but I want you to be pondering that as you hear this word today. But to help give some imagery to it, what am I talking about? What are these circumstances that I'm asking you to reflect on? Well, when I think of situations that I can't change, that I would want to change, I think of a time when I went charter fishing with my family. Here's a picture of me afterwards, very happy to be on land. You can see the big grin and the the dinner that we caught collectively. Uh, That was not the smile I had on the boat. I'll tell you guys that much. See, the day we went out on the boat, there were some very, 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 very strong winds. And waves that I'm surprised we went out onto the open ocean on, you know. And I'm not one to get too seasick, but we got out of the bay, and I just couldn't even handle it. It, I couldn't hold it any longer. I was over the railing, you know. And I realized, wow, this is the condition I'm going to be stuck in for the rest of the day. I mean, you know, with the boat going side to side, you can't even, like, have stable footing. Your stomach becomes a blender that's unsafe, you know, and it's like the smell of fish gets increasing as you catch more and more fish as a group. It's, oh, man, like, th- there's a baseline if you don't know what circumstances I'm talking about. Just fi- picture that disgust that I was in, at least. But then the real question is, when you're in situations like that, that maybe aren't physically, like, out of your control, where you feel uncomfortable like that, maybe it's more of an emotional thing, where you just feel drained anytime you talk to this person you constantly see. Maybe it's something mentally that every, every time you try to plan around and delegate your responsibilities and go in your calendar and set these times to do things, it just keeps getting away from you. Or maybe it's something spiritually that you wish you could change, that every time you talk to God, you just feel like you're talking to the ceiling, and that it's kind of pointless. What do you do in those situations? How do you react in these circumstances you find yourself stuck in? Well, to answer that question, we're going to look at this guy. His name you see on the screen. His name's Jonah. Jonah's had quite a life so far in our sermon series, and we're going to go back a little bit. Last week, we saw him fulfill a calling on his life. God told him to go to the city of Nineveh and to preach the good news and bring salvation to this city. And Jonah just did that last week, but we, we missed a part a little bit where he encounters a whale. Perhaps you've never been to church before, or before you even knew anything about Jesus, you knew this story about Jonah and the whale. You know, it's a very famous media piece from the Bible, and we're going to focus on that today. So if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn to Jonah 1, verse 17, or if you have a device that you access the Bible on, now would be the time to get it out and turn here. But while you're doing that, let me give you a little recap, because it's been a while since we started this series, uh, series on Jonah. And Jonah's had quite a story so far. See, Jonah was called by God as a prophet to go to this city and to bring God's presence there, to bring this sense of salvation to this place. But in the process, Jonah didn't really listen, kind of deliberately so. Jonah hates Nineveh, and I say that with the full force of the word hate. Nineveh was the enemy nation to Jonah. It was part of this empire called the Assyrian Empire, and the kingdom that Jonah was a part of, the kingdom of Israel, to put it in perspective, they go to war 10 years after the book of Jonah. So there's a lot of tensions that are building up right here where Jonah doesn't like Nineveh. He sees them as the enemy. He sees them as undeserving to be saved. And now he's called there. So in response, he does the human option and he says, no way, God, I'm out. And he gets on a ship going the opposite direction where a storm breaks out and he ends up being tossed overboard to stop the storm. And that's where we pick up the story of Jonah in verse 17. And it says this. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called out to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. 
You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. The seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you. Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. This is the word of the Lord, and we could dive into the complexities here, because this is quite a story, an ordeal, might I say, you know, with the whole fish eating a person, and that person living within a fish for three days and three nights. I could be up here talking to you about all what scholars think for hours and hours, but I'm going to take a, a pastoral stance here. I'm going to say that's not the craziest thing in this story. It's kind of a weird stance, but I think that's not the craziest thing that happens here. A man getting eaten and staying inside of a whale three days, three nights, or a fish, or whatever have you. I don't think that's the craziest part. I think the craziest part is that Jonah prayed. And you might be saying, why is that that crazy? It's just a prayer. Well, if you look at the story of Jonah up to this point, a whole book that has his name on it, that's about his life, really hasn't had him talking that much. You know, for a main character of his own book, he really has spoken a couple words let alone he hasn't yet to even talk to God. When he was called by God, hearing God's audible voice in his life, something I think we all very much desperately would want, Jonah doesn't respond. In fact, he, he, acknowledges, he acknowledges it, but disregards it and goes the opposite direction. On top of that, when there is a storm breaking out on the ship, everyone else on the ship, it says, is crying out to their gods. What is Jonah doing? He's asleep silent. But yet here, in the belly of this fish, something prompts Jonah to do the unthinkable, to pray. And I think what really is that prompt, I think what Jonah is starting to realize in his life is something that we've been saying ever since we started this series. And that's that the book of Jonah isn't really about who Jonah is. It's about who God is. You see, Jonah is not a great guy. He's very selfish. He's very sinful, very disobedient. In fact, I would even go even further to add some depth. I would say that Jonah represents the narrow-minded people, the narrow vision, the, the people who are even blind, and the people who are prejudiced. All these bad things. But at the same time as that, through this life of a sinful man, very selfish and disobedient guy, we see that there is a God who is in the story moving who is actively at work. And that work ultimately leads to the salvation of every single person involved. See, I think Jonah's realizing that this isn't his life. I think he's realizing his plans aren't the right plans. But maybe there's something to God's. Maybe there's something to the way that God's working that Jonah wants to be a part of. I think... Through the prayer, we can see this further. There's a clear disjunction or a separation between Jonah's will and his actions. See, his will, I don't think, has changed from the moment this book has started. Jonah is a sinful guy who does not like Nineveh. Again, Nineveh is the enemy. They are the people Jonah views as being narrow-minded, as being blind to their own actions and their sins, as being prejudiced to those around them. And because of that, Jonah doesn't want anything to do with them. He doesn't want to go there to an enemy nation where he's probably going to die, let alone bring a God who is promising to save them. Who would want to save their enemies? So his will is very much unchanged. But his actions are different. Jonah's actions are an act of submission to God. It's Jonah saying, while I still kind of believe these things, I still have these grudges, I see you at work, God. And I want to lay down my plans, my will, my ideas of what's right and wrong at your feet. And I want to see what you have in store. 
Now, where am I getting this from? Am I just making a claim out of nowhere? If we look at some of the other stuff in the passage, I mean, right at the beginning, let's look, right? In my distress, I cry out to God. The word cry out here in the original language, the Hebrew language, is a word called kara. I would encourage us all to say it. You ready? One, two, three, kara. It's a fun word. A little roll R in there. But kara means I cry out. And specifically when it's talking about prayers, it means I'm calling down God's presence to this moment. I'm making a space for God to enter in in conversation with me. And we see Jonah do that here, but I don't think that's really necessarily the point of why he's saying the word kara. I think he's actually being kind of intentional. Because earlier in the book of Jonah, we see the word kara used only once. And that's when God calls Jonah himself. God says, get up and go to the city of Nineveh and kara against them. Cry out against them. Bring down my presence into this city so I can be at work. And I think Jonah, when he's saying, I cut out to you, I want your presence here, I think he's saying it in the same regards, knowing that's how God called him. Because he's saying, God, in the same way the Ninevites need to be saved, I need to be saved. In the same way the Ninevites need you, God, I need you. I think he's now seeing himself as we see Jonah, where he's saying, I am the narrow-minded person who didn't open up to look for God's work. I stuck to my own plan. I was blind to my own actions and my disobedience and to my own sin. And I was prejudiced against them. I am that person that I saw them to be. And he forms this, this link of empathy between his enemy and himself as they're both in need of desperate salvation. But I think there's something even further we can interpret from the way that Jonah is talking about this salvation, the way that he is now realizing he needs to submit to God. And to do this, I think we need to put ourselves in his shoes because I think we can glance over Jonah's story a little bit too much. So if you would, I'd encourage you to close your eyes, and I'm just going to talk about what Jonah was in, what his situation was like. So try to picture along, try to picture that you're the person that I'm describing here, ready? So you're on a boat, and this boat is swaying side to side uncontrollably. This is a dinky wooden boat, and there's a huge storm with 10-foot waves crashing all around you. The sky is pitch black. There's rain peltering you in the face, and the lightning is striking all around you. And before you know it, you have a bunch of people picking you up as you're kicking and fighting them, and they're bringing you to the edge of the boat where they toss you overboard. And your body hits the water, and you start to fight against the currents of the waves. You start to try to stay afloat as you're gasping for air. You're fighting the waves and the power that is behind them, but also the, the cold frigidness of the water as it's sapping away your strength. You start to feel your fingertips go numb, and it crawls up the rest of your arms, and it crawls up your legs to the rest of your body as you're just now just flailing about in the water, trying to stay afloat. But at one point, it's too much, and you start to sink. You can't fight it any longer. You start to accept the position that you're in and you start to sink into the dark, dark depths. And as you're sinking, you're, you're holding your breath for as long as you can, but at some point you have no choice but to just try and breathe. So you open your mouth and water rushes in. At this point, your lungs are burning and you can't stand it any longer. To the last bit of strength, you open your eyes and you see a creature that you have never seen before moving towards you with its mouth full of teeth as it swallows you and everything goes black. If you guys can open your eyes. I think when we read Jonah's story, sometimes we just say, he's in the water eaten by the fish, that's it. And we miss the picture of death that Jonah ex is experiencing. The feeling of drowning. The certainty that I have nothing left to do. I just give up. And then this, this creature that, Jonah would have probably thought it as a myth. This giant creature of the sea comes forward and it swallows him. You remember the terror you would probably feel if you were just sinking in the ocean? and you see a whale just approach you, let alone eat you? But now picture this. Picture the moment that Jonah coughs up all the water in his lungs, that inside the whale he takes his first breath that he never thought he would have again. 
probably reeks of fish and doesn't smell or taste that great, but it's life. For Jonah, that was salvation. He saw that God is someone who is powerful enough to command these mighty creatures of the ocean. Powerful enough to save his life through his disobedience. But also loving enough to not leave Jonah where he was. Not to leave Jonah dying, drowning in the depths. Because Jonah is a man of God. He knows what he's doing is wrong. He knows that he deserves death here. His disobedience was the cause of the storm. The story tells us. And we also know that because when he's thrown overboard, the storm stops. Because Jonah was receiving the death that was in deserving, that was his sinful nature deserved. But yet God didn't leave him there. He saved him. I think Jonah in that moment saw that if God could save him in his disobedience, that maybe he could save the Ninevites as well. And maybe he should. Jonah's recognition of God's power and his love resulted in his submission. And I think we can even track that even clearer than this through his actual prayer. So if you're still with me in the Bible, we're going to start in verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3. And Jonah kind of outlines these steps that he goes through where he, he comes to submit to God. And it's beautiful. So I thought we'll start here. Chap, or chapter 2, verse 3 of Jonah, it says this. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas. The current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I hope you, I hope you heard my emphasis because Jonah is very much calling out God here. He's saying, God, why are you doing this to me? I had my plan set out. I mean, look at Jonah's life before this, right? He was a prophet. He was a man of God. A very high-earning job with very low risk. It's a pretty good gig, if I might say so. He then goes and is living in the kingdom of Israel, where his friends and his families are. He, he's living in a safe place, a mighty kingdom. It's a great life. But all of a sudden, God calls him. He says, hey, Jonah. Go to this enemy nation and cry out against their evilness and bring my salvation into them, into their midst. And Jonah's life was never to be the same. Jonah's life was upheaved from himself. He had no choice in the matter. And he tried to have choice. He tried to run away. He tried to do his own plan again. But at the same time, he struggled because Things just kept happening. The storm happened. The whale happened. Things were out of his control. And he said, God, why are you doing this to me? What have I done? And I think that's something that we often say, right? When situations happen, when we find ourselves in circumstances we don't like, when areas of our life just don't start to follow the five-year plan that we have set up for them, even just subconsciously, God, why are you doing this to me? What kind of karma did I do to deserve this? What is happening in my life for you to single me out of all people? with this kind of circumstance, with this struggle and suffering and pain that I'm in. You start to wrestle with the plan that God has because it's different from your own. And that's, dare I say, a not bad place to start because at least you're bringing it to God. But you can't stay there, and Jonah doesn't stay there either. From there, he starts to see a picture where God is doing this for him. If you don't believe me, we'll turn to verse 6. Chapter 2, verse 6 says this. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, O Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. This is the moment of salvation where Jonah starts to see maybe, maybe there's hope yet. Maybe this encounter with the whale, this, this fear that I felt, this experience of drowning, maybe it's all leading towards something. And he didn't know. I mean, in the story, we can interpretively say, okay, we know where he ends up. He ends up in Nineveh. So he's probably saying like, okay, yeah, I'm going I'm to do this because I already know I'm going there. I'm kind of forced to. But Jonah didn't have a GPS in the whale. There was no way for Jonah to really know anything besides that there was a fishy smell all around him. But yet, in that blindness, he steps out in faith and he says, God, I, you have to be doing something here through this suffering and this pain that I'm going through, 
there has to be more. There has to be good things planned out because I know you saved me. I know you're loving and I know you're powerful enough to make things come out of brokenness. You can make bad things good. I know there has to be something here. So I'm going to trust you. And Jonah steps out in faith. And from there, Jonah starts to see a different picture come out of that as well. In verse 9, it goes like this. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. You see, Jonah, his full picture is this. He now sees God is doing this with him. This isn't just a, I'm suffering, God's a distant deity who is just watching, pulling the strings. But he is someone who is here with me. He is present in my moments of suffering, in my moments of pain. Center Church, hear this. God is with you. Wherever you are, God is with you. And on top of that, he's not just present with you, but he's there empowering you, equipping you. Because he knows what you've been through. We made a comment a couple weeks ago that while Jonah is flawed, he sucks at saving people, he's not a good guy, he's very selfish, and there's barely any redeeming qualities to him. The better Jonah and the perfect Jonah comes later on in the Bible. And his name is Jesus. Jesus, Son of God, fully divine and fully man, he comes down to earth. And he experiences everything that we have ever experienced. Whatever p- situations you're in where you're saying, I, no one understands what I'm going through. This is a burden I have to bear alone. No one gets it. You may be right. No one around you may get it. And there may be no one in this world right now who gets it. But I'll tell you for certainty. For certain, I know that Jesus has experienced it. Whatever it is. In the Bible, it says that Jesus, the Son of Man and Son of God, has experienced every form of suffering and pain that there is. And through his death, he redeemed it. So when you're in your circumstances right now, and you feel like you're all alone, and you're isolated in these feelings of frustration and bitterness, just know there's a God who cares. Just know there's a God who's powerful enough to change those situations and make them good. It's a God who loves you so much that he's going to be there every step along the way. And you may not be able to empathize with Jonah's story as much. You know, the story of a whale being eaten by its little out there. But what does this look like in today's life? What does it look like to go from these steps of, God, you're doing this to me. God, maybe you're doing this for me. And God, you're here with me. What does it look like in your circumstance? I'll ask you again, what is that circumstance that you're in that you would trade away for anything else in the world? I could share mine, and I could go into detail about all that, but I don't think my circumstances do this story justice. Luckily enough, through the Zero Collective that Center Church is a part of, I met a guy named Josh Buck. And I think his testimony is something that you guys need to hear. So instead of me just saying it from up here and and being a third party in it all, I'd like you to hear it from him himself. So, enjoy. vacation in Cancun. I just wanted to go for a swim. And so I just jogged down the beach and dove into a wave. Because of the way the wave crashed down, it took all of my forward momentum, turned it into downward momentum, and I head planted on the bottom. And 
and I dove into that wave, a fully functioning 30-year-old, and they pulled me out a quadriplegic for life. I came to this loathing, couldn't move my arms, and just a moment of terror and, and pain. And if it wasn't for my friend and the lifeguard on the beach, I would have died. The next thing I remember, I was waking up in Miami after my final fuse in surgery. And then I came up to Mariquita for three months of rehab. Towards the end of my time there at Mariquita, I distinctly remember a conversation having with Shelly. And I said, babe, I don't know what it means to be a dad anymore. I can't pick the kids up, toss them in the air. I don't know what it means to be a husband anymore. And my identity was shattered. I had to reimagine what it was like to be a man. And the first couple years were hell. They showed us this video of this guy saying that the price I had to pay to walk again was to lose all I've learned, I wouldn't do it. And I'm like, baloney. You know, he's just trying to make himself feel better. So I remember being at a concert at Burning Bush. And I was driving around the lobby, and, and people were sitting in front of me. And it's almost like I could read their minds. They were thinking, hmm. I wonder what that wheelchair is all about. Why are they vibrating there? And I just kind of looked at them and I thought, hmm, I'd rather be me than you guys. And I said, well, wait, I'd rather be a man than you guys? Wow, God is doing something. And my priorities and my identity are kind of slowly shifting. And I started thinking, hmm, I've learned so much since the accident. If I had to give all this stuff up that I've learned, I wouldn't even do that for a walk again. I wanted to make that stupid video in rehab feel right. And now God has redeemed my identity to the extent that when I get in the wheelchair every morning, I don't look at that wheelchair as some sort of death sentence. You know, I can look at the wheelchair and know, wow, this is what God is using to keep me the man that he wants me to be. And I can honestly say I am a better friend, a better dad, and a better husband than I was before the accident. I am so thankful that we serve a God of second chances, of redemption, who will take the ugly, the broken uh, in our lives, and who will exchange it for beauty and for more of him. It doesn't mean that things are the same as they were before, but they're good, and sometimes they're great. And we just need to wait on him. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. So what is that circumstance in your life? For Jonah, it was a whale. For Josh, it was that chair. In my life, I think it's the timeline that I set for things. 
Well, what is it for you? I can't answer that. I think the only person who can answer that is you and God. Like I said, I, when we started this, the most radical thing in this story is not the whale or the complexities behind that, but it's the fact that Jonah prayed. That he took a step towards making a space where he could meet God. And say, God, show me the end of it all. Show me the good things that are going to come out of this. So this next time, we have a little bit of a longer worship set. And it's for you. It's for you to have that moment of prayer with God where you make space and say, God, just meet me where I am. If you're still wrestling with God, saying, why are you doing this to me? Then ask him. If you're in that spot where you're saying, okay, maybe God is doing this for something, for me, what, what is it for? Then ask him. And if you're in desperate need, saying, God, I can't see you in this picture, then ask him to be with you. the only one who can do it. So during this next worship time, I encourage you to either stay seated, to step to the side to kneel, maybe extend a hand towards God, open up your arms in a posture of receiving, whatever it is to make space for just you and God. I encourage you to do it. He makes the broken things beautiful. He redeems the bad qualities of us. He saves us from whatever circumstances are defining us right now. He loves you. And he's powerful enough to change it, to change this bad around you. So I'd like to usher us into this time with prayer. But remember, the next time is yours. So would you pray with me? Lord, we're here for you. We want to meet with you. Lord, I pray right now that your presence would enter into this room, enter into this place. Meet us where we are. Lord, we're making room for you right now. We want more of you. We want you to fill our lives. Lord, redeem the brokenness in us. Align our plans and our expectations with yours. Lord, we submit it all to you. Show us your way that leads to good things. Lord, meet us where we are. Pray this in your powerful and your loving name.